Hello friends, so I'll be talking on this abdominal compartment. So I have already recorded this talk. So I've just made some amendments to a uh, few, few of the things which I have added. So I'll just do a uh, revision of the whole topic. So when you look at uh, intra-abdominal hypertension, uh, so this is the waveform when you transduce the intra-abdominal pressure. So as you would see, during uh, end inspiration, the pressure tends to increase. And during end expiration, the pressure tends to come down. And intra-abdominal hypertension, we all realize that it is a important variable to be monitored, especially in patients where there is a suspicion of abdominal compartment syndrome. So the normal intra-abdominal pressure is 5 millimeter mercury. So we call it as intra-abdominal hypertension only when there is sustained increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. So a transient increase does not constitute intra-abdominal hypertension because the pressure can go up due to any uh, physiological uh, events like a cough, vomiting, but that is not abdominal hypertension. There has to be a sustained increase in intra-abdominal pressure. More than 12 millimeter mercury is what constitutes as intra-abdominal hypertension. And the the reason why it has to be sustained is it should possibly lead to changes in the microcirculation at the tissue level. So sustained rise causing compromise in the microcirculation is what we call as intra-abdominal hypertension. So there are different grades. So grade 1 is 12 to 15, grade 2 is 16 to 20, grade 3 is 21 to 25, and grade 4 is more than 25. So that is intra-abdominal hypertension. So we call as abdominal compartment syndrome. When there is a sustained increase in the intra-abdominal hypertension, more than 20 millimeter mercury with new onset single organ failure or multi-organ failure. So when there is an increase in intra-abdominal pressure associated with single organ or multi-organ dysfunction is when we call it as abdominal compartment syndrome. And to reiterate, intra-abdominal hypertension is not same as abdominal compartment syndrome. But they, it, it constitutes different stages of the same pathologic process because the sustained increase leading to perpetuating of the circulatory compromise and microcirculatory hypoperfusion leading to organ dysfunction is what we call as abdominal compartment syndrome. So as you see pictorially, this is the normally 0 to 10 and after 12 is the amber region where one needs to exercise caution and possibly this is the phase where one should intervene to take measures to reduce intra-abdominal pressure so that it does not lead to abdominal compartment because once the organ dysfunction sets in, obviously the morbidity and mortality also would significantly increase. So our level of intervention in intensive care would be in this uh, yellow region where measures have to be put in place to reduce the intra-abdominal hypertension. We'll talk about it. So when you look at the classification, intra-abdominal hypertension is classified as hyperacute. As I said, hyperacute is predominantly where it is physiological. There is no sustained increase. So it can be vomiting, cough, uh, any of these physiological reflexes which can lead to increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Then acute intra-abdominal hypertension, which evolves over a few hours, this can be due to inflammation within the abdomen or due to over-resuscitations where there is a fluid sequestration within the abdomen or the abdominal wall leading to increase in intra-abdominal hypertension. So that is acute. Subacute is where there is a evolution of increase in intra-abdominal pressure over course of time, which is few days. And this can be due to ascites, which is not a very hyperacute sort of a situation, or subacute intestinal obstruction and so on and so forth, where things have evolved over few days. And chronic is where there is progression over very uh, many months, like in pregnancy or obesity. Not necessarily this would possibly lead on to abdominal compartment because of the adaptability of the body to chronic increase in this pressure. So this is the way they have classified intra-abdominal hypertension. And it is shown that polytrauma is one of the important cause of uh, increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. And up to 14% of the polytrauma patients can develop abdominal compartment or, in, uh, or intra-abdominal hypertension is what has been referenced. So we look at the etiology and risk factors of abdominal compartment. So broadly, they're classified into primary and secondary. 
So primary is where the causes are confined to the abdomen. Primary causes of intra-abdominal hypertension. So any injury to the abdomen, so be it a penetrating injury or blunt injury to the abdomen or a trauma involving abdomen can be one of the commoner cause of intra-abdominal hypertension or a lot of edema within the abdomen, ascites within the abdomen or fluid accumulations in the abdomen or, or intraperitoneal hemorrhage. So any bleeding or sequestration of fluid or blood within the abdomen leads to intra-abdominal hypertension or large tumors present within the abdomen which are growing in size or peritoneal tumors, all this can lead to intra-abdominal hypertension. And there are causes which are related to the gut involvement, so inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic bowel, or simple constipation. In fact, even in our ICU, we have seen patients with chronic constipation, where basically it leads to intra-abdominal hypertension due to bowel obstruction, subacute intestinal obstruction due to constipation, or bowel obstruction due to any other mechanical cause, or diverticulitis leading to obstruction, and uh, and tumors, bowel tumors. So all these are the primary causes. And the commoner, commoner cause we see in ICU is the pancreatitis. Acute severe pancreatitis is one of the common sort of a clinical situation where we see intra-abdominal hypertension. The secondary causes are not confined to the pathology within the abdomen. So over-resuscitation. So increasingly we have recognized that cumulative fluid balance leads to increased morbidity. And one of the reason the, the cumulative positive fluid balance leads to uh, multi-organ dysfunction is by increasing the intra-abdominal pressure and abdominal compartment syndrome. Increasingly, we are now contemplating on vexes where we look at over-resuscitation and venous congestion as one of the cause for organ dysfunction. So, one needs to keep a close eye on the cumulative positive fluid balance which can lead to intra-abdominal hypertension and this can be seldom recognized unless you have a high index of suspicion. And severe sepsis also is one of the cause and burns. So these are secondary causes where cause not necessarily is confined to the abdomen. So this is in essence pictorially put in as the etiology and risk factors for compartment. And grade 3 intra-abdominal hypertension where you have a pressures of more than 20 with abdominal compartment. Why is it important? Because it has a direct bearing on the mortality and there can be 3 to 5 fold increase in the risk of mortality. When someone develops grade 3 intra-abdominal hypertension compartment, there is activation of the whole cytokines, pro- and anti-inflammatory uh, mediators gets activated. And this leads to breach in the mucosal barrier in the gut level. And this can lead to uh, cytokine activation, hypoxemia, hypotension, and hypovolemia. So there is a SERS response, overwhelming SERS response that uh, gets perpetuated by activation of these whole cytokines. Uh, in, when the intra-abdominal pressure uh, significantly increases leading to abdominal compartment syndrome, leading to multi-organ dysfunction and death. So this is an important slide which I've added, uh, which wasn't there in the previous is the systemic effects of intra-abdominal hypertension. This is very important for all the trainees. So as I said, severe intra-abdominal hypertension leading to abdominal compartment syndrome, morbidity and mortality can up to 40 to 100 percent, which means this is an important condition to be recognized and treated. Otherwise, the mortality significantly increases. So, when there is increase in the abdominal pressure, what has been recognized is it has a effects, it has a deleterious effects on all the organs because the microcirculation and the circulation and the perfusion of multiple organs get affected. So, we'll start from head to toe. So, the intracranial pressure increases. So, if you are dealing with a polytrauma where you have resuscitated, over-resuscitated, and there may be a pathological injury with TBI. So one needs to keep an eye on intra-abdominal pressures because it can lead to worsening of intracranial pressures and reduction in the cerebral perfusion pressure. And at the cardiac level, it can reduce the venous return. Your cardiac output can come down and your systemic vascular resistance can increase. So which means because there is a decrease in the preload, so cardiac output can come down. So... And this also forms an important constituent, especially in ICU, in abdominal compartment. In the lungs, I keep telling my trainees that when there is abdominal compartment, your gas exchange versus. You would have seen this in pancreatitis where, because when, when pancreatitis is worsening and intra-abdominal hypertension is worsening, you would see that the patient would get more hypoxemic, would get tachypneic. So your intrathoracic pressure increases, pulmonary artery pressure increases, and they develop ARDS sort of a situation where lung compliance comes down. 
they they will develop hypoxemia hypercapnia and increase in the shunt fraction increases and i'm sure most of the listeners would have dealt with pancreatitis would have seen when the per- pancreatitis perpetuates and worsens you would see there is worsening in the respiratory failure also and this is due to the compartment that sets in and even in the liver the hypoperfusion leads to increase in the lactate and the portal circulation also gets compromised and in the gut so they can have gut hypoperfusion leading to increase in the lactate so you would see in pancreatitis lactate increase may be an indication of your microcirculation getting compromised due to compartment and that should be an indication where you should be more aggressive in relieving the intra abdominal pressure and one thing we see very commonly in the subdominal compartment is your renal perfusion gets affected that is hypoperfusion of the kidneys and the aka gets sets in you are you have reduction in gfr and reduction in the urine output so remember this picture so uh, keep this picture in your mind so abdominal compartment syndrome does affect multiple organs and uh, it does affect uh, organ function across and it can lead to organ dysfunction and organ failure so so this is something which is important one is to recognize and in any intra abdominal hypertension you would have seen traditionally generally surgeons would say measure the abdominal girth and studies have shown that the measuring of abdominal girth is grossly inaccurate and these are the studies which indicate that the sensitivity is only 40% so right now with advancement in monitoring intra abdominal pressure so measuring the abdominal girth is almost become obsolete because the, uh, its ability to recognize worsening of intra abdominal hypertension is very very poor <clears throat> so the tools that we need to measure intra abdominal pressure has to be accurate reliable and reproducible and uh, abdomen is a non compressible so pascal's law applies so you need to have a good sort of a tool to measure intra abdominal pressure so the gold standard is vesicle pressure and it has been shown very clearly that intra vesicle pressure or the bladder pressure which we measure as a surrogate of intra abdominal pressure is a good correlative of intra abdominal hypertension and i'm sure most of the train is listening it's very easy now to measure intra abdominal pressure we connect the three way to the foley catheter and one of them is transduced to the pressure bag and we infuse 25 cc of the saline within the bladder and close the bladder outlet and transduce and that would give you the intra abdominal pressure very simple maneuver i'm sure many icus are doing this as a routine in patients where intra abdominal hypertension is present and the zeroing should be done at the uh, axillary mid axillary line which corresponds to the iliac crest so the zeroing is done and the transducer is placed at the mid axillary line uh, and that is the level of zeroing and which corresponds to the iliac crest so this is an important thing which i have added to the previous one so there, this is a very good study which came in 2000 uh, where they have seen whether intra abdominal pressure is representative of organ perfusion or is it the map so obviously abdominal perfusion pressure is map minus intra abdominal pressure or is it abdominal perfusion pressure so it's a good study where they have looked at area under curve for different uh, of these three tools and they have looked the receiver operating characteristics roc for abdominal perfusion pressure was very good and it was indicative or correlative of organ perfusion uh, and intra abdominal hypertension as compared to map your roc was only 0.616 and if you look at only if you take only isolated intra abdominal pressure so its correlation to hypoperfusion and abdominal perfusion was very less 0.291 which means to say i think this is an important slide which possibly trainee should remember that abdominal perfusion pressure is more indicative of the deleterious effects of intra abdominal hypertension and the microcirculation uh, uh, which is uh, not compromised or which is maintained so this is something which needs to be kept so abdominal pressure perfusion is more indicative and possibly the question one should have is what is the abdominal perfusion pressure that one should target so that this is a good number for trainees to remember this came out from this study so as you see uh, someone who maintained an abdominal perfusion pressure of 69 so you can remember 70 had a better survival as compared to someone who maintained around 60 so it's very easy 
for all our intensive care community to remember. So if you have a patient with intra-abdominal hypertension, try to at least look at abdominal perfusion pressure and maintain at 70, which is associated with good survival as opposed to 60, which was associated with non-survival and that came from the study and it was statistically significant. And uh, so this is something which, which is something we could remember and apply in our practice. So the management of intra-abdominal hypertension, so there are medical and surgical treatment. So improvement of abdominal wall compliance could be achieved because in pancreatitis, we know that we sedate them, we put them on neuromuscular blockade so that we reduce your, our airway pressure and try to improve the perfusion by keeping them settled. And most importantly, medically, what we can do is try to evacuate all the viscous. So obviously, we should have a rice tube to decompress the stomach. We can put the flatus tube to decompress the bowels and use certain medications to improve gastric emptying like metoclopramide or erythromycin and use certain medications in a graduated way to improve the evacuation of the bowel contents like neostigmine or physostigmine, obviously with a good monitoring. So medically, as an intensivist, at least we could apply all this, put in a flatus tube, put in a rice tube, which we do it very often and put them on metoclopramide and neostigmine if needs be to facilitate evacuation of the hollow viscous. So these are the medical measures one could put in to uh, decompress and reduce intra-abdominal pressure. Then there are most important is potassium and magnesium correction has to happen concurrently. And very important message is to keep the potassium ahead and not lag behind, which means if potassium is 3.5, don't aim for normalizing to 3.8 or something like that. At least try to keep it more than 4.5 so that you are ahead because the potassium can lead to vicious conundrum of ileus, which, which perpetuates and keeps worsening if you are chasing the potassium as opposed to being ahead of the potassium. And medically, what we can do, we can evacuate any fluid collections that has happened. So if someone has an ascites, an ultrasound guided drainage of this fluid. In pancreatitis, we have seen this, that if there is any fluid collection, we do put in a pigtails to evacuate it to reduce the intra-abdominal pressure. And this we have seen in dengue also, where uh, we would have given large volume resuscitation, chasing the hematocrit. We would see stereocytes with effusions in the pleural cavity and the peritoneal cavity and patients getting worse with shortness of breath and lactates going up. There also we do put pigtail drainage under cover of platelets and significantly it improves the cardiac output and reduces your lactate. And we have seen this in practically. So it is important to keep this in mind. It measure intra-abdominal pressure where you are giving large volume resuscitation and decompress the stomach by draining these fluids. And these are all very important. And so pigtail drainage is the way to go to correct all this and to drain the fluids. And if all this don't settle, then obviously you have to take them for laparotomy and keep the abdomen open. And there are various surgical methods. We won't go into detail. So this is the Barker methods where you keep the abdomen open and you, uh, and you drain out all the excess uh, fluid there. Uh, so, and this is a temporary abdomen closure surgeons do where they keep the abdomen cavity open and, and they close it in a superficial way. Then there's something called sponge based negative pressure wound system. So there are different surgical uh, ways where we keep the abdomen open and drain the, and, and decompress the pressure. Uh, so this is another important thing. So the relation. So why we are emphasizing on uh, evacuating any fluid within the abdomen because there is a critical pressure at which there is an exponential rise in the intra-abdominal pressure. As you see, after 15 to 20, there is an sudden exponential. So even a small decompression or evacuation of fluid or decompression of the viscous can lead to significant reduction in the intra-abdominal pressure. Like in ICP, we see that by putting an EVD and draining a little bit of CSF significantly reduces your ICP. Same principle applies even in intra-abdominal hypertension. So, so that's an overview. So it is important for every trainee to recognize that any patient where there is some ongoing abdominal pathology or especially in situations where large volume fluid resuscitation is used, keep in mind that we should measure intra-abdominal pressure because this can seldom be missed in the whole context of things. And unless we measure the intra-abdominal pressure through recycle pressure, we would not be able to ascertain the presence of intra-abdominal hypertension clinically by abdominal girth measurement and have an high index of suspicion in pancreatitis where you are giving large volume resuscitation in burns or in trauma patients. So these are the typical situations where 
very surreptitiously intra abdominal hypertension can be present leading to organ dysfunction and high index of suspicion is needed to correct this and reverse the whole conundrum so thank you one and all so I end with this beautiful quote uh, so you can re-hear to this lecture by visiting to my website www.drpradeepanapad.com so thank you one and all